Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Azar Bestavros. I know many of you, but maybe some of you don't know me. I'm uh, a professor of computer science. I'm also the director of the Hariri Institute for Computing. And uh, we are here to celebrate um, uh, uh, Chris's um, uh, appointment, selection, as a uh, junior faculty fellow at the Hariri Institute. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the Hariri Institute and about this particular program. So we have been in existence for about six years, um, a little bit over six years. And for the first three years, we're sort of under the radar because we're just trying to figure out what we really are. Um, but the last three years have been just amazing in terms of um, finding connections across the university. Um, the Institute's mission is really to connect computing and data sciences with all the disciplines in the university. We believe, and I think all of you agree, that uh, there is no science that's not a data science. Let me just put it this way. There is no science that's not a data science because everything now using data is, is very important and part of that has to do with uh, algorithms, machine learning, data mining, all these things that uh, we worry about for in computing and data sciences. So, so this is the mission of the institute, to act as this connector between what BU is very strong in when it comes to computer science and engineering, but also where BU is very strong in the disciplinary uh, aspects. And certainly, uh, we found a lot of traction, so there's a lot of interest in that. Um, the very first program I launched at the institute the very first program, like within two months. I think Mark was on the steering committee at the time, <laughs> and it was a junior faculty fellows program. Um, the idea is that if you believe what Anwar just said, every department is now hiring people who are data scientists. They're doing scholarship in their own fields, but they're really also data scientists. And in order to create that critical mass that can find each other and talk to another, we decided to create the junior faculty fellow with the new faculty coming on board at BU, connect them to one another, get them into their second home, which is data sciences and, and the Hari Institute. Um, and this has been the best program we have uh, done. So this is a competitive program where the nominations are, are submitted and every year we select uh, a cohort. As a matter of fact, the deadline for application for the next crop is coming up in a, in a few weeks. April 11th, so, um, so if, uh, we, we really hope that, that uh, we get the best. Um, um, you know, the nominees don't know that they're being nominated, and they shouldn't know. And then when announced it, they're so happy. So, <laughs> um, so um, with that, I'd really like to, uh, and I want to say a few words about the Hurricane Institute. Please follow us. Please come to our talks. Um, we have a lot to offer that is not sort of your usual computer science type things. It's, it's we're really about empowering you and connecting you with others. Um, you know, I don't want to take too much time to talk about what we do, but, um, but the least you can do is join our mailing list and maybe join us as an affiliate and then you'll get a lot from us. So with that, Tony, I'd like to have you introduce. Uh, <coughs> okay. So I just want to take a couple of minutes to, uh, to introduce Christoph. Uh, Christoph came to BU uh, just a few years ago. Um, he finished his, uh, did his PhD at the University of Michigan with Arun uh, Agarwal, one of the world's uh, best scholars on sustainable development, on land change science, and then went on to do a PhD with Eric Lamban uh, at Stanford, equally distinguished. And so he comes to us with this, with this wonderful pedigree of uh, of uh, doing research at the interface between human decision making uh, and how the actual surface of the earth changes, potentially as a consequence, potentially for other reasons. The, the topic that he's going to talk about um, is really, uh, I think, one of, the, one of the really most important topics in, in uh, conservation, in understanding land use change, and that is what works. There are a variety of, of sort of policy experimentations that one can do. And what works? How do you evaluate success? What does that actually look like on the ground? Um, and how can you tell if, in fact, you are making a difference? Uh, for, for some of us, this will be the first time we've heard Christoph talk at length about his research since his job talk. So we're, uh, we're anxious to hear uh, um, everything that's happened. Um, but for everyone, I think we can look forward to a really stimulating uh, and interesting <coughs> discussion. Christoph. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thanks so much, Azar and Tony, for the introductions. Um, good afternoon. I think this is a great time first to say thank you. I don't want to say that at the end of the presentation. I want to say that at the very beginning. I'm very grateful for the support of the Hariri Institute, not only as a junior faculty fellow, but also for a grant that we just received that will take this work to the next level. So thank you for that. I'm very thankful to the college and the department for allowing me to have a five, six year period um, to work on something that takes a lot of time to build. Um, so that is a unique opportunity. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Mark, for proposing me for this pro to this program. I hope I'm not embarrassing you now. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and then uh, um, I'm very grateful as well for the incredible remote sensing group that, uh, groups that are here at this department without whom this work would be impossible, as much as to the incredible IT staff that we have without whom this work would be impossible as well. So thanks to all of you. This is, all of this would be impossible without you. And thanks to all the others for coming. Um, I'm, I'm very glad to see, uh, to see this turnout. Um, I want to start with a question. Um, with a question for you. Can we switch off the, one of the lights? Is that, yeah, is that too dark? OK, wonderful. If you had access to data of all the properties in the United States, where they are, who, they, who owns them, when did they sell, what, how they're zoned, whether they're protected, demographics around that area, terrain, wetlands, whether they're on a lake or on a river, how accessible they are, whether the land cover on them changed over the last 30 years. What questions would you ask? And I'm asking that question because, well, I built a thing. <laughs> and I built it for a purpose that has to do with my research agenda. But it is multifunctional. It can be used by lots of other people that are interested in working with this data for reasons, for questions that they want to pursue. Right? It is not exclusive. Um, I will justify my research from my perspective and somewhere where I come from. Um, but this question, I think, is a larger one. If you had access to this kind of information, what would you do with it? And two qualifiers, most of those parcels I, I, are of conservation interest, which means they have a minimum size, uh, larger than a hectare, and most of them are not urban. So if it's about like where to buy your next Boston property, that's not going to be the answer. Um, and the, it is also about questions that are of academic public policy interest, because many of the data sets in here are licensed for academic use and not for private use. Okay, so I want to leave you here with that question and keep, keep that question in, in, your, in, in your mind as, as we proceed through the talk. All right, so where do, does my framing, my question framing come from? As, uh, as initially mentioned, my um, question has to do with, my questions have to do with, uh, with the effectiveness of conservation. And uh, my talk is structured in, uh, is, will, be, will be given in four components. The fir first, I will, you know, justify my framing. Where does it come from? Um, why private land conservation? Why now? And what are the interesting questions? Um, I will spend a little time explaining how, what it took to build the system that I'm talking about, which I call places, um, for the nerds in the room, and also just to add some realism and perhaps to explain why my publication record over the last two and a half years is not as, as I would like it to be. Um, and then I will show you already first indications, the first uh, analysis that we have done with this data um, on two very different topics. One is about impact of protection in Massachusetts. The other one is work that is on the way on automated easement appraisals in Colorado. So th these are just like the first little fruits that come from this database. And as I mentioned, uh, the Hariri Institute has just given us a grant to scale this up uh, to a much larger area. All right. So back to the framing. What difference do conservation interventions make? This is a question that many people ask. I say if most people that, that study, that study in environmental science, many students that come into those programs want to make a difference. They want to know what works. And they're not the only ones. There are donors around the world that spend billions of dollars in the aggregate on supporting conservation programs anywhere on the planet. And this question about does this money actually make a difference? Do we, do we make a difference is, is a big one. Um, and, a, and an important one, and one that has different answers for different contexts and different policy instruments. 
And so I specialize in this kind of, in answering that kind of question. Um, most of my past work, if you ever uh, come across my website or my current profile has to do with um, work on the deforestation frontiers of the world. So we've looked at impacts of protected areas and indigenous land in the Amazon, um, zoning in the Argentinian Chaco, both of which are deforestation frontiers that are deforested very, very rapidly right now, and you see them from space pretty well. Um, and uh, other work was uh, we did in the Congo, in Colombia, etc. Mo most of it is on very large scales. And the interventions that happen are big interventions, large interventions where we can see on the satellite imagery how those interventions made a difference. So, but those large interventions, those big interventions, are actually relatively rare. You know, you might see, okay, uh, Brazil reducing deforestation by 70% over from between 2004 and 2008 and following, which was a unique event which, which, which everyone working on the Amazon is aware of. Uh, or anyone working on the American West is probably aware of the Northwest Forest Plan, which made major regulatory changes for, uh, for the, the future of forests in, on, in the West. But there's a lot of conservation that happens at very, very small scales, at the parcel level. There are parcel level transactions, protecting this parcel, protecting this parcel, this parcel, small parcels, another hectare, another five, another 10, etc. And those are small, but there are many of them. And it's a big financial investment um, in the United States and in some other countries. So in the United States alone, direct public funding for land acquisitions for the purpose of conserving land uh, was in the order of 2.5 billion per year. Um, tax donation, uh, tax incentives for donated uh, land were in the order of about a billion per year. Um, another billion per year more or less comes through philanthropy. So these are all rough numbers, but it's a large activity. Here's a map of how that funding is, how the public funding is distributed, which I made a while ago, um, at the county level. So we see a concentration of spending in Florida, for example, here in New England, and then in, in New York and the neighboring states. Um, and also on the, on the West Coast and in Colorado. Um, and it involves many, many organizations. There are thousands of land trusts, there are hundreds of local governments, there are several state governments and the federal government, all of which are engaged in that activity and are shaping the landscape of conservation in the states. There, the most rapidly expanding conservation instruments in the United States is the conservation easement. It is a transfer of a partial right to a property. It is a permanent restriction that is parcel specific, that can have any kinds of regulations in it, and that usually reduces the ability of the landowner to subdivide their land, build additional things on it, use it for agriculture or timber, um, depending on what the easement is. Every easement is different. And there are more than 150,000 in the states. And this map shows a distribution of area, which is somewhat similar to the map of funding you saw, but not exactly. For example, you have massive easements in, in, in New England, which are forestry easements, so you can still do forestry but cannot subdivide them. And so this is, this is the main driver of conservation in the States today, of like parcel level conservation. And it's not only in the States. Other countries do that too. For example, Colombia had a law since 1993 that obliges all uh, local and state governments to invest 1% of their resources in land acquisitions. Um, and we have a project uh, in which we try to bring that data together and do similar analysis. Uh, Chile is another country where we are running analyses um, because of a quite large number of private conservation initiatives. There is no global survey, but it is happening in many countries, especially those with very strong private property rights. Australia has a lot. We don't do work there because Australia have a lot of scientists that are doing already work on that. Um, and so what kind of questions are interesting to ask? Well, the, the, I usually frame my questions in three general categories. One is, uh, where does it happen? How much does it cost? And what difference does it make? The combination of which should tell us what, what, what overall, like, is this are these good investments? Are these, uh, should we expand them, et cetera? Um, 
But then when you break those questions down, they can mean, they can, they can mean a lot of different things. There are a lot of interesting sub-questions. You know, what, what, what are the private lands that attract conservation? Are, are there certain lands that just get, are more likely to be protected? Does it have to do with whether they're species or whether they're beautiful views? Um, or whether people just want to make sure that their neighboring property doesn't get developed? Um, you can ask how many disadvantaged communities have access to parks? You know, like where, where, where are they located? Um, does the public get a fair deal? There's the, the land conservation movement has had several cases in which, like high profile cases, in which it was said that some people made a lot of money from those interactions that shouldn't. Um, does parcel level conservation increase fragmentation? If you don't protect an entire area, but just one by one, do you increase the probability that uh, land cover changes around those parcels? Um, and then the larger questions, how will the landscape of the future look like? Um, what outcomes can we reach with the given budget, which is a question, for example, of interest for uh, someone who wants to invest uh, carbon credits or uh, in a natural resources damage program. Um, how much carbon emissions were avoided? So these are all sub-questions of these overall larger questions, um, for all of which we need data. The good thing is, in the United States, there is a lot of data. Um, for every state, for every county in every state, you can, um, the parcel, parcel data is, uh, usually exists. Somewhere there are good records. The records are usually accurate. And in most of those places, you can know where the parcels are. You can even, there's a digital map for it. Actually, not, still not in every county, but in most of them. Uh, when you have that data, you can intersect it with all kinds of other spatial data and get the information that you want to answer the kind of questions. You can look at this parcel uh, in 1992 at the satellite image or the aerial photography and then see that something happened to it from one time to the other. If you also know when it was sold, you might even know who did that. But to, do, to work with all of this data, we're talking about millions and millions and tens of millions of parcels here. You need a system, a system that um, is distributed on servers that do all the computations uh, decentralized because not one computer can crunch all that data and, uh, and help you get tenure because it would probably take five years to, to crunch all of that. Um, and so uh, I noticed that the best investment I could do at the beginning of my tenure track here was investing in a system that would could produce those data sets quickly, um, that would use all those public data sets and turn them into parcel level rich information that could then be used to answer all these other questions. I call it uh, the Private Land Conservation Evidence System. I would say that's a working title because it has a nice acronym, if you accept that the A is a big one. Um, and um, it currently has 20 million parcels in it in the counties that are marked here in dark green. Uh, the county is marked in light green for those we don't have the locations of the parcels, but we do have uh, sales, the tax assessor information, which we can, for which we usually have points, but point locations, but not, um, not the spatial boundaries. Um, and so here's what this data includes. Uh, well, everything starts with a spatial parcel boundary. And then from there, we, uh, those parcel boundaries, where do they come from? Well, originally they come from the, the county registries, from the, um, from the registrar's office in, in the, in the, is that the right term? Anyway, from the counties, but because every county does their own thing, actually in many places every town does their own thing, they need to be aggregated. And so they're commercial aggregators, the good ones are very expensive, the so-so ones are not that expensive, and many states make parcels, parcel data public. Massachusetts does, so Massachusetts was an easy one where you can create a public data set um, without infringing on, on, on the strings that are attached to some of those, some of those data. Um, well, and then you can continue. You can natural features. There are a lot of good data sets from the US, from USGS, from the US Fish and Wildlife Service on where the lakes are, where the rivers are, uh, where the wetlands are. Um, land cover change, you observe that through satellite data. And again, I'm very happy to be in a department that has really good remote sensing teams, some of which um, are, uh, some, whose products, some of whose products are used here in, the, um, in an analysis I will show. Um, for those who are not aware of that, there are data sets here where for at 30 meter resolution, we observe, can observe land cover change at any, essentially any temporal resolution um, for the last 30 or more years. 
Um, and that, that fine temporal and spatial resolution is crucial to make some of this work work. Um, infrastructure, ownership, sales, structure, valuation, all that information is with the tax assessors uh, of the different towns and counties around the country, um, which is also aggregated by expensive real estate companies. But thankfully, Zillow decided to make their records accessible to academics. And so that data set was really, really interesting to start pulling into the system. We want to look at conservation. So of course you need information of where conservation happens. Where did transactions happen? Which parcel was bought? Was it an easement or not? Who did it? A public, a, a local, a state uh, organization, an NGO, um, or someone else? Again, these are, these are data sets that you need to pull in. Um, in addition, we are want to get even richer details, so we started uh, coding some of the documents that uh, provide information on what exactly the restrictions are on an easement and how the value of that easement is appraised. And then, of course, demographic information gives us a lot of, a lot of stuff that we could not easily observe from space, such as how rich is the population, population that lives in this area um, and how dense it is. So all of that information has to be brought together. Um, and I just want to uh, have uh, two or three more slides on two particular technical issues I ran into, um, and that actually made, made uh, this process a lot slower than I thought. Because if you see this and you have done some spatial work and some GIS, you might think that ah, should be easy. You just like, do like some spatial intersections and then you do some joins. Question? Thank you. Um, with parcel, I essentially mean what the tax assessor calls a parcel, which is in most cases, uh, w well, which is a polygon um, that is owned by someone to, to, to w at the level at which ownership is defined. A, a, par a property, de depending on how you use the word property, can consist of several parcels. Several parcels can be sold together, but at the end, it's like the smallest unit at which ownership is defined. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to clarify. Yeah. All right, so um, two surprises for me was how hard it is to do spatial intersections um, and how hard it was to link uh, the property boundary data to the tax assessor data. Um, and so I just want to spend a few slides on those. Uh, so the first, uh, I don't want to say constraint because it's not really constraint, I wanted to do that anyway, but we're working on the shared computing cluster which runs Linux. Um, and so it does not run Windows, which means that the classical tool that almost all, everyone who has ever worked with GIS knows does not work. Um, good invitation to look into what is working on Linux. Um, the first uh, package which I looked at was a Python package called GeoPandas, uh, which is uh, essentially the, I would say at this point, the standard for, for vector manipulation or vector data set manipulation in Python, it did have topology errors for the spatial intersections. Um, then we, well, I moved on to QGIS2, <coughs> made it run after a lot of help actually from one of the people in the department, Chris. Uh, it also actually produced errors that were hidden. There was a bug in that program that was not uh, made very public. Finally, I made everything work with Grass, uh, which is another tool, which also created its own uh, area of issues. QGIS 3 came out just two weeks ago. We finally got it working, well, I finally got it working on the servers, but there's still a few issues, but the polygon intersections work. And so, one week ago, <laughs> I noticed that GeoPanda as the new version actually does not have topology problems anymore. And so, great. Um, I built the database new uh, yesterday, two days ago, uh, on, a new, on a new folder with, uh, on, on a new space with where we have now 10 uh, terabytes instead of uh, uh, 200 gigabytes. And it worked smoothly. And so finally, the, all that process is done. But it took a lot of time. This took a lot of, far too much of my time. Um, <laughs> all right, the second issue uh, is the joy of matchmaking uh, when you want to connect parcel numbers that are provided by MassGIS, for example, the parcel data of Massachusetts, 
and that provided by Zillow, which contains information on buildings and on structures and on value and on uh, sales, etc. Well, they don't use the same syntax. More so, every town in Massachusetts has their own syntax. So what do you have to do? You have to actually develop a way to extract information from this syntax, from this syntax, and then convert it and put them together. Um, so in the end, there was the need for something that, that would be able to connect this, which means we actually have a lot of handwritten regular expressions and a lot of conversion patterns um, that, that were needed to make to, to connect this data from Massachusetts. There's actually one student in the audience who is taking this work further for New Hampshire and, and Connecticut. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, so we have been able to connect about 50, 60 percent of the counties that we have so far. The data sets are great for Massachusetts and for Colorado, and now it's like about expanding that. So when I was wondering, when, when I tried to answer the question, why is no one actually already doing such a data set? Because that should exist. Here are some of the answers. <laughs> Potentially. All right, but now we have this data. So what can we do with that? Um, as I mentioned, I want to uh, have just show two, uh, two applications, uh, one which is done in, in, in the publication process. Uh, the other one is in the process and is the main emphasis of, um, of my work this year. So Massachusetts gave us a really good opportunity to test uh, the question of impact. First, what difference does did, did protection make? In Massachusetts, because there are many parcels that were protected, because we already had a fine resolution, fine temporal scale um, uh, uh, land cover change data set for Massachusetts developed here. And, uh, and so we, we, and the data, data set was public, so we knew, even knew that we can publish the Massachusetts uh, parcel data set. So there are about, 220,000 parcels uh, larger than a hectare, that larger than one hectare. Sorry for the European measure. I know everyone here works things in acres. Um, no, not everyone here, but everyone in this country uh, that is not a scientist, um, probably. Anyway, uh, we have about 220,000 parcels, of which 6,600 were protected in that time period. And so in the time period 85 to 2006, the uh, land cover change data set went until 2012. So to have like some post-protection time frame, this is where we, where we had to keep the cutoff. And then the question is, what difference that does it, did it make? Did it actually reduce conservation? Did it reduce development? Did it reduce forest loss? Um, which is not necessarily an obvious, uh, you, there's not necessarily an obvious answer to that because uh, across the world, a lot of conservation happens where it makes the least of a difference. It's a, it's a global pervasive, very well documented phenomenon that a lot of conservation happens where there is very little threat. So the question is, is that the case in Massachusetts or not? Uh, the other interesting question that, uh, that I mentioned earlier is that of, of uh, unintended fragmentation. If you protect one parcel, it has been documented that the value of the properties next to that protected parcel rise because people are li like to be next to protected parcels. Now, if that also means that there are more development happens next to that protected parcels than otherwise, you would increase fragmentation by protecting a, a specific parcel. You would, you would protect this parcel, but you would lose something elsewhere. Did that happen in Massachusetts? All right, so a lot of uh, the land cover change that you see in Massachusetts is this low, um, low, density, um, low density development. And uh, if you look at where those, where, where the patterns of, uh, where, where forest loss and where development uh, happens uh, across the, the state, and where protection happens, you see some interesting patterns. So back to the allocation question. Uh, blue here is the probability that a parcel gets protected as a function of covariates. And then uh, green and yellow are the probability that it gets developed, uh, that, that it loses forest or that it gets developed. Um, as a function of the same covariate. Um, for the blue and uh, for the green and the yellow line, it's only unprotected parcels. So we don't get a bias from the protected parcels in there. So you see, well, one thing you see, those patterns are highly nonlinear. You know, okay, if, if you were to control for other covariates, they might become more linear, but you definitely have very nonlinear, uh, nonlinear one-dimensional patterns. And what you also see, for instance, here, if you see a, 
um, you see that the shape of the protection function of the empirical probability of protection is almost the mirror image of that of a development in forest loss. So those areas that are most <laughs> likely to get, uh, to get um, developed or, or lose forest are also the least likely to get protected in this case. Um, but overall, there was one, uh, one covariate that was particularly strongly associated with the likelihood of protection, and that was parcel size. Large parcels, much more likely to get protected. Which makes sense, of course. Uh, you want to reduce transaction costs. You want to uh, protect the big chunks. Uh, most conservation organizations want that. Um, but it also means that if you don't know how big the parcels are, if you, ha if you do an analysis without parcels, you miss that pattern. You miss the fact that people will be going after the big parcels. Um, all right, so that, that, that's in terms of just where those parcels are. Now, what, what difference did they make? Now, to understand how, how, how would you quantify uh, how much difference a intervention makes? Um, this is the, the kind of question that the field of rigorous impact evaluation tries to get at. And there are... Uh, a range of methods um, to, to try to do causal inference with, with observational data, with data that doesn't come from an experiment. Um, then there's one that uh, I use a lot because it's one that's quite nice to use and it's also very easy to communicate. And that method is called matching. Um, matching takes uh, units that were treated, in this case parcels that were protected, and then looks in the pool of unprotected parcels for those that are for the one or right, for one or more um, that were as similar to the one that was protected as possible in terms of all the variables that you put into this analysis. And so it is a very data hungry method. It wants you to have essentially data on theoretically everything that has to do with the likelihood of protection and the likelihood of forest loss. In practice, you try to get as the best data that you can. You run the analysis and then you try to infer. Uh, whether or not you've there are some variables that you missed and what impact that would have. Anyway, we did have a lot of, of variables that came from, from the system. Uh, and so we ran this, ran this analysis for Massachusetts, <coughs> measuring, so essentially what you get, you know, we have 6,600 protected uh, parcels, and then you have a very large number of unprotected parcels, and you end up with the pool of the unprotected parcels that is as similar to the pool of protected parcels as possible. And then you follow them through time and see how well they're doing in terms of land cover change. Right? So the outcome measured is the average annual percentage of forest loss or development. And we used uh, the time of protection plus three, or the year of protection plus three, um, until the end of the time period for which we had data. Now you wonder where does that plus three come from? It came from the observation that there are certain parcels that lose forest at the same time that they are protected. Um, anyone can guess what this is? Golf courses. Yeah, these are golf course easements. So an easement is put on a property that prohibits, let's say, residential development, and then it's developed into a golf course. Um, and you see the time of protection, which is blue here, really coincides with the complete loss of, in this case, forest cover. So you have, and this is not only for, you don't only see that for, um, for uh, golf course easements, you also, also see that for subdivisions, for easements that are created because a subdivision was created. And so to get that effect out, we added a few years and say, okay, we measured after, after that. Um, we did a lot of other controls. But again, th that kind of detail you don't get if you don't have annual data and if you don't have it at the right resolution. So this is really a good example of how good how much fun it is to work with this data. All right, so the big question, the one question was, did protection reduce land cover change? The way how this graph uh, tries to answer that question is that for each of those types of land cover change, we have one bar that indicates the expected rate of annual land cover change with protection. And then on the other side, what would have happened if it was not protected? So that is essentially what you have observed on the control group controlling uh, for additional uh, bias with, with a linear regression. Right? And so the answer to this question is yes. Protection reduced land cover change in Massachusetts. 
And when I was presenting that at the conference of the Massachusetts Land Trust, there was a big smile. <laughs> Good, <laughs> okay, we, did, we got there. Um, pressure is the main determinant of impact. Whether or not a parcel has a big impact is a lot less determined by how much deforestation or de development uh, you have on the parcel, on the protected parcel, all of which are usually protected and you don't see a lot of change, you see a little bit, but it's, the impact is much more determined by what would have happened on that parcel would it not have been protected, right, on this hypothetical value which we infer from the control group. So not using the control group gives us completely uh, biased results, right? We would not see this if we didn't do this control. Uh, we could also look at uh, you know, different types of organizations, state, local, NGO, different types of instruments, and overall we find impacts for, for the vast majority of them, although not for all combinations. Okay, so what about the second question? What about the question whether conservation increased forest cover loss around the protected parcels? For that we repeated the analysis, and we just selected uh, uh, parcels that were around the protected parcels or that were c close enough, so with different, uh, with different definitions of close, um, and matched those two comparable parcels. So essentially the treatment was this parcel is close to a parcel that was protected. And so we reran, we, we did the same analysis, same, same covariates uh, to see whether that happened. And the answer was no. Protection did not increase land cover change in Massachusetts over the last 30 years on, on neighboring parcels. On immediately, this, this is for immediately adjacent parcels, those within 200 meters. We ran the analysis for several buffers until essentially you cannot do this analysis anymore because everything just becomes one big hodgepodge. Um, but we could never observe a increase. So these are like the, the, the one, the sum effects that you see here uh, like, if anything, it's a decrease in, in land cover change. So we could not observe anywhere in Massachusetts an increase in land cover change that seems to have been caused by the fact that a neighboring parcel was protected. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first time that this has been done at the level of the state, um, F of a state, um, and with this rigorous method, with this like long-term analysis. Because one thing that, we, that this also allowed us to do, the annual the data set of deforestation, was for every parcel to start measuring deforestation, uh, the, the land cover change from the moment of protection. Right? So every parcel was actually matched at the time of protection to another parcel, and the next 100 are matched to others in this year, et cetera. So all that, that kind of uh, analysis allows us to be very rigorous, uh, to be very confident uh, in those results. All right, so yeah, we, we really don't see that, that effect that was feared so much, and now, with the, with the new funding, we will scale this up to everywhere where we have parcels um, once we get the national data, land cover change data set ready, or at least for parts of the country. Wonderful. All right, so the, um, this is one example of what you can do with this kind of data. Um, the other, I want to get quickly into another uh, topic, which is the focus of my work this year, um, which is about cost estimation. So for anyone involved with systematic conservation planning or trying to understand where to invest for carbon credits or where to most effectively reduce species, uh, species loss or where to create parks, understanding how much it will cost to create a certain level of protection anywhere in the landscape is really crucial. And it's also very difficult. Um, there are actually very few, um, very few analyses that, that you know, are able to do that at the fine resolution and at the large scale at which, uh, let's say, you might want to do this analysis if you consider a, a national investment in protecting forests. Um, so quantifying cost at the parcel level is, is really important. Um, and the, the protection of parcels with conservation easement is a particularly interesting subcase of, of quantifying the cost of, uh, the cost of protection. Because when easements are created, they are almost always appraised. Almost always when someone creates an easement on a property, an appraiser will be hired 
to quantify how much is that easement worth. Now an easement is worth uh, the difference, let me just, the difference between the market value, the free market, the, yeah, the, the fair market value of the property with the easement and the fair market value of the property without the easement. That's if you think about the value of a property, what it actually is is a value of the rights to that property. And so if you reduce the amount of rights that someone has, the value should always go down, right? The value of those rights. The, the, the ecological value might go up, but we're talking about the, the value of the rights, of the private rights to the land. Um, and so that those appraisals need to happen uh, either, let's say, because Massachusetts, the Massachusetts um, Department um, of, Parks and, of Parks and Recreation um, wants to create a new park and wants to justify the public spending and wants to make sure that the deal that they made with the, with the landowner um, is, is fair. Or it might happen because someone donates an easement to a land trust and then uh, classifies that as a charitable donation and can then deduce it from their tax return, from their income tax, which is, a, which is for many a major, major incentive to donate, uh, donate an easement to protect their property um, or to give up rights to their property in perpetuity. You can only get that tax deduction if the easement is perpetual, and the vast majority of easements is perpetual. Perpetual means forever. Forever is a very long time. Um, all right, so how does the appraiser do that? Most appraisers, the vast majority of appraisals that I've seen and the vast majority of techniques that I've seen uh, include, uh, follow the comparable sales method. So I mentioned an appraiser has to try to get a sense of what the property is worth without the easement. And how do they do that? They will um, go to uh, the sales data of uh, other sales in that county or sometimes outside of that county and say, okay, what other properties have sold? How much did they sell for? How comparable are they? And they come up with usually a set of six to maximum 15 properties. And then, say, okay, and then they start adjusting, adjusting the value of those properties. They say, this one is, has a less good ac road access and this one is next to a lake and this one uh, it has a better view, et cetera. So they start adjusting, having certain vari variables that they use to reduce or increase the value of that property relative to the, the one they try to evaluate. And then they have to come to a point estimate. They have to say not, oh, it's more or less like this uncertainty distribution, but no, it's this value. And then they do the same thing for the property without the uh, with the restriction. Right? So they look for properties that have sold, that have easements on them, and that have sold in that you know, general comparable geography, and, um, and do the same thing. You know, those properties have all different values, and they have to like, kind of make a qualitative expert opinion argument about how, they are, uh, how their relative worth is, and have to come to point estimate. This is exactly what the value is. This is my professional op opinion as a certified appraiser. And the difference between those is the value of the conservation easement. Is that clear? Cool. Um, so that sounds simple at first, until you realize that there is actually a considerable um, cost to this process. Uh, the, an appraiser can usually cost about $2,000, might be $3,000. Uh, in some places, I've heard in Massachusetts, there are some places where it's 15,000. It really depends on what that, what that costs. But it's not cheap. It's, the, it's certainly not something that you can scale up easily to a whole landscape when you want to understand, when you want to do prioritization exercises. The other problem is that because we're talking about a large uncertainty distribution here, there is a lot of leeway in where the appraiser finally determines what the value, what the value is. So that point value that the appraiser has to, has to find you know, he cannot get around this problem and say there's an uncertainty distribution, he has to find this point value. But what that value is, 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 is qu can be quite subjective. And so a, this, this is to some extent unavoidable, right? You just don't have enough, compare, might not have enough comparable sales. Um, but there is a big problem in here. Um, the appraiser might be bi may be biased. 
you could assume if the public hires an appraiser, like if a, if a public uh, state if a state agency hires an appraiser, they want to make sure it's a good appraiser that is not bi that, that the appraiser is not biased. However, if you donate an easement as a landowner, you hire the appraiser. If you have the choice between appraisers, you know one of them will give me has the reputation of really giving like high appraisals, and the other one does not have that reputation. What do you think whom you're going to go to? Given that tax returns are really secret in the United States, we still don't have the tax return of Donald Trump, for example. So just to give you an idea of how hard it is to get that information, right? So it's private information, private transaction, private appraiser. Those private appraisals have led to major upheavals in the land trust community. Um, there is a uh, article which is called the billion dollar loophole uh, just came out uh, last year. Last year the IRS made a certain type of easement deals a listed transaction which means they, they, they experience particularly high scrutiny by the IRS. Um, so what, what, what investors have done for instance is to buy a property for let's say five million dollars, <coughs> find an appraiser that appraises that property at thirty million dollars, put an easement on that property, say, well, that reduces the value down to five million or four million, and then get that twenty million in tax breaks. Right? And this hasn't happened once, this has happened frequently. And it's a big it's a big issue that the land trust community still tries to like, find out how to how to deal with it. So what if we had an algorithm that would use all the data that we have about those parcels, about thousands of comparable sales in a certain geography, and gave us an estimate of the value of a conservation easement. Right? So in, 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 those, in those analyses, we have about 6 to 15 observations. This is something I pulled up from the system yesterday. Uh, in Massachusetts, we have about 100,000 uh, parcels larger than one hectare for which there is last sale information. Um, in Colorado, we have about 126,000. Um, try to scale that up to the United States. So we have, we have a very large sample to work with. Yes, every state is different. Yes, every state has different regulations. But you probably will be able to find through matching or through whatever algorithm you use, um, uh, a, a, an, est an estimate that at least is not biased by the appraiser wanting to increase the value of the easement. Right. Question? Are the names of the appraisers known? The names, well, the, the names of the appraisers are known. Well, um, they're known to the IRS. If you, if you are a, if you are someone who uh, donates an easement and you hire an appraiser, that appraisal report is part of the tax, becomes part of the tax return. It's not a public document. However, so wh what we are working with are appraisals that are um, for easements created by, um, through public funding. And as soon as public funding is involved, the appraisal becomes public information. So we are try we are, uh, well, we, well, me and uh, at this point, I think, uh, 12, 13 uh, undergraduate students over the course of the two, last two years have coded uh, a lot of appraisals and easements, and those are exclusively state-funded uh, easements. Um, so you can say, well, if we, if we get close to what the appraisers actually do, or we can even show how well they are doing it compared to the, the reference, which, and the reference is predicting the prices of, of encumbered properties, the sales prices of encumbered properties, um, then we can at least, we just go with the assumption that those public appraisers are not strongly biased. And then we can, at le we can develop an algorithm and could hand that to the IRS or to a regulator. There are lots of different institutions that would be interested in having an unbiased app uh, appraisal uh, and a cheap appraisal. And, um, and then they could probably filter out relatively quickly whether those which are within the suitable range, uh, within the range that seems appropriate and those that are just blatant blatant inflated appraisals. Um, so this is the main focus of my work this year, which includes you know, writing grants to do this really well. Um, but we've already started, I've already started to, to play with some of this. Um, I presented this slide 
at the at the BU Data Science Day. Um, so for some properties, we already have all the information we need, which means not only do we have the information from places, but we also know that this property has been appraised, uh, it has been protected, and it has resolved. Um, so the first one that I pulled out from that sample is this one here, which is uh, about 1,200 acres, acres uh, in, um, in Colorado, you know, on a, on a river uh, surrounded by public land, lots of species. It was appraised. Uh, for nine million dollars, uh, if under, uh, if, if without an easement, and then the appraiser said, if it's protected, the value will be about 3.6 million, uh, which means the difference is 5.5 million, which was paid by the Great Outdoors Colorado program, which is Colorado's uh, lottery-funded uh, state-level uh, land acquisition program for for conservation purposes. Uh, and a main partner in all of this work. So it's from them from whom I got all the appraisals and the easements. So they pay that, and then two years later, uh, the owner turned around and sold the property for 6.5. Well, that's of course only one observation, but it shows that those values can be, mass can, can be massively off. Uh, I did run at this uh, stage a, a random forest on the data that I had or on, on like data that I was certain was high quality because appraisers had used it, uh, 250 estimates, and the estimate that we ended up with was a lot closer to the one that had this property actually sold for uh, than, than the one that it was appraised for. So how well can we quantify the value of easements? We don't know yet. The assumption is it is possible. It is probably like, it is very, it is likely that we will at least have less bias, or that an algorithm mm, can be designed in a way that it is less biased uh, than those of uh, privately hired um, appraisers. And so uh, if we get there, if we can estimate the cost of conservation for any parcel in a given landscape, or a relatively good estimate of that, that helps a lot of different people. It helps the tax authorities, it helps the Colorado state regulators who have to approve tax credits if they, if they, uh, if they, uh, for tax credits for, again, for, for um, donation purposes. Uh, Colorado, the state of Colorado actually had almost stopped their program for an entire year because of controversies surrounding appraisals. Um, it can help uh, academics interested in systematic conservation planning to finally get the fine-grained cost data that they need to uh, make predictions about if we want to protect this species, here's where and here's how much it will cost if we want to create new parks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is where much of this is going. Um, and if you are a machine learning wizard, you know, one of those magical people, I would love to work with you. Otherwise, I have to become one myself. Yes? <laughs> Oh, because you can use it for what there is there. So this pr property, let's let's have a closer look. Well, for example, what you see here is agricultural use, right? Then there's a bridge here. Oh, you actually don't necessarily see it, but this is an agricultural field. I think I put this uh, this big horn sheep right on top of the of the house that is there. <laughs> um, so that might be a little bit of a biased view, but. You can use the property for as a recreational ranch, but you cannot, let's say, subdivide it and make a big complex out of it. Question? Is the place definite an estimate of the sale price? Like a, a net sale price, or could this be appraised as your appraisal that matches the place price? That's a good question. So, of course, you can think about those, like the, the way to get towards the right ap appraised value in, in several ways. You can either model what the appraiser does which is you take the sample, you, you, you try through matching, identify the most comparable properties, you do some adjustment, and then you come up with a value, um, which is not what I did here. Or you can just throw the entire sample in there, uh, in, uh, in, a, in, one, in, in, in this case, a random forest algorithm, um, and then predict the value for that particular property, given, given that algorithm. Can you, can you repeat that? So like, if it's being appraised, am I not speaking loud enough? What's, What's that? that? No, 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 can you just? Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, if, if the, 
appraisal values tend to be under the next sale value, mm -hmm. won't the places estimate then also be higher than the appraisal values? I'm not entirely sure whether I understand the question. So just to clarify, this one here is essentially a prediction of the sales price. Uh, so if we have 250, in this case, 250 properties, all of which sold. And the sale price of those sales is predicted through the random forest algorithm. Oh, so I guess then my And so we're is predicting the sale price for this property under the condition that it was protected. With yeah, the so I guess my question is, are you trying to get a sense of what the better appraisal value is through this? Yes, essentially, yes. We're trying to get at, uh, well, we're trying, well, what we're actually trying to get at is the difference between those two. Right? So yes, it's interesting, of course, to know how much is this property worth with and without. But what we actually want to get to is the difference between those two. Here, we only looked at what the appraised value of the, of the uh, sold land is with an easement. We have lots of questions. Um, it's also almost the end of the time. But yeah, um, I take questions now. Yeah, why not? Uh, yes. do technically when the size of the parcel that the tax assessor is actually keeping track of uh -huh. doesn't match your one hectare uh, minimum. Oh, what am I doing if the parcels are smaller? Yeah. yeah. No, good question. Uh, well, I would say you would probably have some edge effects at the sample, you know, where, where like you get towards one hectare. Uh, most of the properties are, are larger. Um, the simple answer is I just reduce the minimum parcel size from on my system, which is just one of the parameters set to exclude mostly urban parcels. Most things that are smaller than one hectare are just small urban parcels. Um, I would expand that sample if I think that is a, that is a concern. I have a particular reason area. for asking, which we can talk about yeah. offline. Yeah. There were more questions. Yes. Y yeah, so when, when a property is sold publicly, don't, don't all easements need to be made public? Yes. Easements are, yeah. well, this is a good question. Not every landowner who buys a property knows that there is an easement on it. Usually they have to know. Like yeah, they, isn't, they, isn't that like real estate research, fraud? But it has, I know that it has at least happened that landowners bought a property and they didn't know that there was an easement right. on it. And, um, and so my question is, if, the, if those easements need to be known, isn't this like a hedonic pricing problem where... Mm -hmm. It's just a big oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. regression with what's the difference of the easement. Exa exactly. Just yeah. that okay. the, probably the functional form of, of that regression is completely unknown yeah. because we have a lot of parameters that have strongly nonlinear relationships and pro probably very locally specific relationships with, with sales value. But other than that, yes, that's exactly the approach. Yeah. Right on. Yes. So uh, at the very beginning, you said you can use uh, ArcGIS because it doesn't work with a cluster. So uh -huh. have you tried it on your own machine or other Windows machine? Does it have the same topological error? Oh, yeah. No, ArcGIS does not have those typological errors. ArcGIS does this very nicely. So uh, the problem is slow. that I want to run this on 3,000 machines at the same time. Yeah. Um, because the polygon intersections take a lot of time. Polygon intersections are quite ex expensive computationally, actually. Um, and so I need to run this county by county, and I need I cannot run this on my own machine. Nor like even even ten computers would not be enough to, to okay. comfortably run those intersections. But uh, yeah. I have another, another so question. So is that possible? The parcels change shape. So like the landowner split the parcel to two and sell half of it, or is that possible? Will it influence your algorithm? Yes. Well. Your first question was, is that possible? Yes, it is possible. Yes, it happens all the time. And yes, all the parcel layers usually only refer to one particular time period. Um, you can probably use, use several, several years, but for now, the system only takes it from one year, which creates problems. You have to check for that. You have to, for example, compare. If you find a good match, you have to make sure the area, the reported area is the same. It, there are lots of quali like small quality controls built into that system to make sure that that we have, we have a good, good match. Um, but it is, it is a problem. And those parcel layers have to be updated regularly, for why is it, which is why it is good to have a system where you just throw in a new parcel layer and it generates all the data for you. Yeah. That's, that's a question there. In the back. I have a quick question. Very interesting talk. Uh, uh, nevertheless. Uh, did you run your model here actually also for the parcel 
without the system, uh, without uh, the, the the rebate on that entire story? I did not do that. And yet. don't you have yeah, yeah. the same money distance it's, it's between it might that be. because it's exactly. a market value yeah. which is fluctuating yeah. all the No, time. that's exactly right. You might yeah. have that, yeah. 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 No, this is, this is ongoing work. If I wasn't teaching that much, I would already have done that. <laughs> That's the short answer. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, earlier, you had a map of uh, the counties or regions of the, uh, the United States where you had uh, the full parcel and sales information, and and there's a north-south line like through West Texas where oh, there's yeah. just no information available. Is there any what's 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 the reason for that? Um, it's just, I would have to speculate. I would have to speculate. Well, my general assumption is that counties that have uh, generally wealthier populations and more people uh, will have a higher uh, ability to invest in a good information system at the county level um, and will also have a higher need if there are more transactions uh, and general <coughs> higher need for transparency. Um, but I would really have to speculate. Yes, you definitely see that you have this, this really this hole, this line here. Uh, where you're missing data, and all of these are, the, yeah, of course, the planes. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not entirely sure, other than uh, that I assume that th there was not the, well, the aggregators who are, well, both the county offices and the aggregators aggregating the count county offices' data have a higher incentive to focus on those locations which have expensive land and which have a lot of transactions. And that's why you see less development in, in yeah, central. Oh. Are signing up to 10 years, for example, mm -hmm. of not farming land that they've traditionally mm -hmm. farmed. Have you have you tried to? I mean, all these places that don't have data, that's where the conservation or reserve program is quite important. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the conservation reserve program, for those who are not familiar with it, is essentially a temporary land right transaction. So where easements are permanent, conservation reserves are contracts uh, made with a landowner. Uh, in most of the uh, current literature, that's referred to as payments for environmental services. Um, and yes, most of those happened in the in, the, in, in exactly the area for which we do not have data here. Um, well, the f first question is, how would it fit in there, uh, data-wise, if we had information, of course, on where those uh, conservation reserve investments took place, uh, we would be able to include that. From the few conversations I had with people that, are, that have worked on this program, that information is actually not accessible. So you, as far as I know, uh, you, can't, you don't have parcel information about who, which exact place was protected when. You can have county level aggregates, or I think perhaps even finer than that. Um, but I believe that there were certain uh, privacy restrictions to, uh, related to that. Um, other than that, you, could, you would estimate the impact probably relatively similar. Um, you would run, let's say, yeah, you would run into the same problems of inference, and you, but you would also be able to use the same methods and the same data. I'm not sure whether I answered your question, but. Uh, there's not a big difference between evaluating something like the Conservation Reserve Program or, or private land acquisitions. But, uh, more. No, another follow-up question? Or? Well, but how do you do this where, I mean, in New England you're doing it, you're measuring, you know, forest loss and disoxy. Oh, okay. The impact. Well, whatever you can observe. And I think no one knows better what you can observe from space in this room than, than you and your colleagues in the remote sensing uh, uh, research groups. Um, if you can't observe it, you can't measure. If you, if you cannot observe it over large scales and consistently over, over, over longer time horizons, uh, it's not, well, you need to collect the out on outcome data on the ground or you cannot do that. So yeah, that explains why most of my work is on deforestation because it's the one easiest land cover change to observe. Uh, and development is also getting increasingly easy, but for many of the changes that, that you have, it's, it's, not, it's not easy to observe from space. You get a lot of error. Yeah. I think two more questions. So one in the back and one uh -huh. yes. yeah, you kind of briefly, um, <coughs> you briefly mentioned some of the challenges that you, that you went through, but could you talk through uh, 
just sort of or skim over, I guess, your process um, for how long it took to navigate these systems. You said at one point like two years. So, uh, so was it? You know, could you just break down even if it's three months here or six months there, and then how 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 long how much the team was? Because I'm trying to get an, I have a similar project, uh, and I'm trying to get an idea of like how much sort of human power um, uh -huh. is necessary, or what's the balance of human power and computing power it's when you're navigating these systems that, you know, like you said, some of them are written with different nomenclature, et cetera. Yeah. So like how, yeah, what's, could you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Um, thank you. Um, I would say, so until, okay, first, of course, all of this builds on an enormous amount of human work. Uh, both uh, any of those data sets were large teams of people that have have worked on them um, bringing them together was until until very recently a one man exercise so i i didn 't have a team I just did that myself essentially um, with the exception of coding appraisals and easements, which was a which didn 't need a lot of manpower and as I mentioned more recently, um, I was happy to have uh, have help with, with connecting the, uh, the parcels to the tax assessor information. Um, but other than that, this, so far, this was uh, mostly my own uh, work. And it's hard to really trace uh, exactly how the path uh, went, but it took essentially all the time that I wasn't teaching or advising, <laughs> which was, uh, so yeah. yeah. I'll try to go quick. So. The focus of what you're looking at is essentially um, restrictions on parcels where land use mm -hmm. has been restricted in some way, shape, or yes. form. I'm wondering about the complement. For example, th most of the country is not under some kind of a land use mm -hmm. restriction, right? But you've got a really rich database with a lot of information. And I'm thinking about things like agriculture and rangelands. Can you think about ways that you might use the database that you've built to try and inform how land managers might manage farmland, manage rangemen more effectively? It just seems to me like there's this whole other complement to the, to the hectorage, to use your term, uh, that might be sort of, I don't know, really interesting and useful to look at. Yeah, so uh, in terms of other applications of this data set, I actually believe there are quite a few. Uh, I, I've talked with all kinds of groups that are interested in working with this, and I haven't even started advertising this in the general, many of the academic communities. Um, <coughs> let, me actually, let me actually answer this question with my very last slide, which are about, which is the same one as you saw before. If someone has a question, I would be very happy to make sure this data set suits the purposes for that. If, you, you know, if there's one variable missing, at this point, it is really not a big effort to add another data set into the system. Um, most, of the, most of the things are, are in place and working really smoothly right now. All right, so this, again, this was a lot of work for a specific set of questions that I would like to ask. For those who would like to ask different questions or collaborate on answering those questions, I'm very, I'm a very happy collaborator. Yeah. Well, so first let's thank you. Christoph for an amazing talk. I think this is, I can say without a doubt, in the last, I don't know, three, four years you've been doing this, this is one of the best presentations by a junior faculty fellow, just judging by the amount of questions and interest. And uh, so thank you very much. This is amazing. Um, as a matter of fact, we'd like to end with a little gift that I'm going to give to Christoph. Um, he cannot tell what it is, uh, so I'll tell him what it is. It's, uh, it's something that, um, if you go to the website of the Institute, um, we're very proud of how we think about computing and data. We think of it as a magnifying glass, that through which you see a very different picture than if you didn't have the data. And I think today you get to see when what he is presenting is just a different perspective about how to, to look at the problem which all of a sudden you can ask all sorts of questions, just like you get a magnifying glass and you look at your problem through the data lens or through the computational lens. Mm -hmm. So um, we always give um, our you know, junior faculty fellows and sort of people that we really care for this little gift, 
which is a magnifying glass. It has the name of the institute in it. You probably will not use it. You're still young. But when you get a little older, <laughs> perhaps you can. Uh, it will become in handy. And uh, I just really want to thank you for a wonderful talk. And um, you know, uh, one thing that I say about junior faculty fellows, we like to sort of bring you in so that you're an insider. And then we can sort of help you with the research. You didn't even wait for more than a year to, to leverage that. And we're looking forward to a lot more uh, uh, work with you. So congratulations. And thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for coming. Um, if you're not American, as I am, one thing that this data set does really well is help you to get to know the country. <laughs> that's a good question to ask. So that's something that you, that, that, yeah, magnifying glass on, on the country. Yeah. Good stuff.